a, a small this. group. All right, but, I'm going to turn the recording on because we want to capture some of this. Yeah, all of it. All right. So, Bill, why don't you kick off? Yeah. So, uh, I want to welcome everyone. It's a small group, but uh, uh, I, I, as Deb said before, whoever's here is it's the right people and we do record this. So uh, hopefully others who are not physically present or, or not virtually present can listen to the recording later. Uh, I, I chair of a green committee of the Journal Square Community Association. We, we were holding these meetings on our own and Deb joined and she said, why don't we do it together? Maybe we can get a bigger audience. Well, as you can see, it's not many people, but whatever we have, we have. And we've actually had quite a few really good discussions. We'll take a break now for the summer in July and August, but we meet uh, um, the third Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. And we've had uh, great speakers. Last month, for example, we had Barka Patel, who's director of the city's Department of Infrastructure, and uh, Mike DeCiancia, who's the city's senior forester. And they talked about the city's, um, the infrastructure department and its plans for this calendar year, as well as uh, last year, the city engaged in a participatory budgeting exercise whereby the residents of each ward could vote how they wanted to see the city allocate up to $50,000 in spending and Ward C, where Journal Square is located, the residents voted to devote all of their money to tree planting and as did the residents of Ward B and the residents of two other wards um, divided up their money, but with a substantial portion, portion going to trees. So Mike DeCiancia discussed the city's plans for tree planting. Uh, Unfortunately, it's woefully short of where it should be, but, you know, we working together, Sustainable JC and the Journal Square Community Association Green Committee, whatever pressure we can begin, we can build uh, to get respect from the city for the desires of the environmental community, so much the better. So, Deb, I'll turn it over to you now if you want to introduce Dan. Yeah, so I mean, just giving building on what you were saying, you know, and, and you know, just this year, in addition to Barker Patel and the infrastructure department and looking at participatory budgeting and that concept for the city and, you know, what that could be for the future, um, you know, looking at urban forestry, a, uh, you know, presentation prior to that by the American Forest Group which the city of Jersey City is doing business with to look at how tree planting can happen in an equitable way in Jersey City, right? The participatory planning vote by, um, you know, by the, you know, community showed up that four out of the six wards wanted more trees, right? So there's been a little bit of focus this spring on urban forestry. And then prior to that, we were talking about, um, you know, uh, and we hosted one of my board members in an air quality 101 primer discussion. You know, we uh, recently, the city of Jersey City with the Health and Human Services Department received um, a, a huge EPA grant to monitor air quality here, right? It's a big deal. SJC is the lead nonprofit. We're doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but the, you know, purpose of that half a million dollar grant is to monitor air quality here in Jersey City, which happens to have the, you know, the highest rate of both adult and childhood asthma in the county, right? So what we're trying to do is build an audience here around engaging folks who, who are other community groups, other liaisons for other community groups, everyday, you know, stakeholders. This is not an exclusive, you know, conversation. Um, we'd like as many people as possible to kind of get educated by these hour, hour and a half long conversations, which are really important. So we have city officials, we have academics, we have 
industry experts. And we're gonna do um, you know, more of this starting again in September, as Bill said, we take July and August off and we'll try to build an audience for this. We're calling it the Community Green Committee, you know, because it really is kind of a hub for all the spokes, if you will. Lots of the neighborhood associations have a green committee like Bill's organization does, but no, nobody's talking to each other, right? So we're trying to have some coordinated conversations, some collaborative efforting go on here. And Dan, thanks so much for, you know, for leaning in. So you're representing Schneider, right? Yep. Um, which is the city's ESCO, the school district, which, you know, the school district and the city of Jersey City don't work together as much as we'd like, right? They, you know, now have contracted with an ESCO just a few months ago. And those people, DCO, um, you know, it's too bad. I would have liked Schneider to have won that RFP for the school district. Be recorded, Deb. Careful. Yeah, I, I got it. I told them already. Okay. So they're, they're, they're going to present in September. So Everybody kind of gets an, uh, an idea and an understanding tonight of what an ESCO is, what Schneider's doing for the city of Jersey City. And then in September, we're going to hear from DCO and hear how they are working in the same capacity for the school district, right? And, um, you know, some of this has, uh, you know, very important implication around how Jersey City reduces its emissions right, which we've been advocating for for years. So Dan is gonna educate us tonight and then we're gonna get further educated in, in the fall. We'll probably invite Dan back. You know, we're trying to work with Schneider on uh, education initiatives for youth in Jersey City. There's a little bit of a, you know, uh, sort of, a, 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 you know, I would say in the background of things, lots of people trying to collaborate together you know, both for general education for adults, but youth uh, curriculum opportunities that we can push through the school district and also workforce training. You know, energy efficiency is huge. That is transformational, both for the city and the school district. So Dan, I'm gonna hand it over to you to talk a little bit about what that opportunity looks like. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the intro and the kind words. Uh, obviously, and happy to talk to you guys. And please interrupt me as, as we're going. We obviously have a small uh, group here, so we can all ask questions and uh, get engaged as much as need be. So just stop me as I'm going here. I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen. Uh, and while I'm doing that, um, yeah, I've, so I've been with Schneider Electric for uh, about, give me one second here, make sure I get this up. Let me know if you can see my PowerPoint here. Yes, yeah. okay. Awesome. So yes, yeah, so I've been with Schneider for about 12 years, uh, working with mostly public sector customers in New Jersey, uh, mostly Northern Jersey, school districts, cities, towns, uh, community colleges. Uh, and this project is obviously the work that we've done uh, with Jersey City. I actually live in the Heights. Uh, so I'm close to Pershing, uh, Pershing Field or Pershing Park. Um, so I've been here for, uh, I guess, about a little over 10 years as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, really the infrastructure side of what the what the city is doing. Obviously, the the city has a lot of different projects that they're working on. I'm going to focus on uh, really our scope of work that we're probably uh, 60 to 70, maybe 80 percent done uh, in. Really that much. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Things are moving along pretty well. Um, I had, you know, kind of dusted off an older presentation here and added in a couple of progress pictures so we can share what we're going over. But really the, um, you know, the impetus of this is trying to help the municipality become more sustainable and more efficient, right? So if you look at Jersey City and the building stock, the municipal buildings uh, make up less than 1% of the entire, you know, building infrastructure in Jersey City, but it's, I think the way the city viewed this was an opportunity to kind of lead by example, trying to become more efficient. So uh, I don't need to do too much of an intro about kind of Schneider Electric and who we are, but we work with uh, entities all around the globe. Uh, we really are focused on sustainability, energy management, 
Uh, we do all different types of projects in in buildings and facilities, but uh, in this case, you know, we really aligned with the sustainability office in Jersey City, uh, as well as engineering, architecture, uh, finance to kind of put this project together. But we very much had uh, kind of similar values in trying to uh, make significant progress when it comes to uh, sustainability. So, uh, you know, on that point, uh, you know, over the past really 10 years, uh, the mayor and the administration, the city council has been uh, relatively vocal on making commitments, on making progress with different uh, sustainability initiatives. Uh, obviously, a couple that are mentioned here uh, that are specific. Um, you know, obviously, making some of these commitments is is easier than following through with them. So I think our project was a solid uh, opportunity for the city to kind of move forward with some of these commitments on reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, relating to their their building infrastructure, right? Um, so when we came into this project, we responded to an RFP. Uh, we were selected by Jersey City, and we kind of laid out a whole uh, litany of goals uh, for Jersey City, again, focused on the municipal buildings. Uh, they really wanted to reduce energy costs, operational costs. They wanted to continue and position uh, Jersey City as a, a place that leads when it comes to sustainability. Um, as you all know, there's a lot of older buildings in this area. Many of Jersey City's facilities are older than 50 or 100 years old. Um, so what comes with that is a lot of older capital needs uh, that needed to be addressed. Uh, and we also identified some pretty unique ways to uh, make the city more resilient in terms of when the power goes out, being able to keep more of the critical facilities uh, online. And then another big one, uh, indoor air quality, obviously is something you know we all care about post COVID, but uh, it really started before then in terms of trying to make sure indoor air quality is as good as possible in a lot of these uh, a lot of these facilities. And then also working with uh, local contractors and trying to market to uh, you know diverse businesses and local businesses that could potentially bid on and be a part of you know this overall pro project. Um, so just real quick, uh, as far as our relationship with the city, we were really hired uh, as kind of a turnkey provider uh, for this ESIP program. So we did all of the upfront, uh, what we call auditing or project development. Uh, we came to a construction. Hey, Dan, hey Dan, explain what an ESIP is. Yeah, so I mean, ESIP means Energy Savings Improvement Program. Uh, so that is a state uh, program that was set up by the Board of Public Utilities and managed by the Board of Public Utilities uh, that really applies to any public sector entity in the state of New Jersey. Um, private entities can can do similar things, but under you know a different type of program. Uh, but the basic concept is you, you know, you look for energy savings opportunities in your facilities and identify where you can reduce costs through energy efficiencies and uh, more or less capitalize those cost savings uh, in the form of uh, either some form of, of debt or lease purchase where, you know, you're saving a certain amount and the savings are paying for the cost of whatever those improvements are. So it's really like a turnkey program where we're managing it uh, start to finish. I think I do have like a conceptual graphic here. So if you look at uh, Jersey City's budget, if you dig deep enough, you might find that they were spending about $3 million per year uh, on energy costs. Uh, about 1.2, maybe 1.5 million of that was in the facilities that we were investigating. A lot of that was in street lighting and uh, traffic lighting, that's a, a fairly large utility expense for the city that we really couldn't impact. And then there were also some newer buildings that we didn't uh, didn't get into as much because they were basically brand new or lead or what have you. Uh, but again, again can we make, make a note to circle back to the street lighting thing and what's going on with- Yeah, let's do it. I, I would love P to- PSDNG and all of that because people, people call SJC about this like, Three times a week. Yep. <laughs> Give me something to stay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do. Let's let's circle back to that. Um, yeah. So 
the basic premise of VSIP again is you're you're taking your utility budget, you find ways to save money, maybe it's 30%, maybe it's 50%, and we come up with a turnkey project with Jersey City where we're implementing everything, we're providing a savings guarantee, uh, and then in turn, the city can finance uh, based on those savings to pay for the cost of the project. So in this case, you know, if you're looking at uh, over a 20 year period, uh, sufficient savings to pay for about uh, $14.6 million in uh, capital projects. Uh, so that's both savings from electric costs, natural gas, water, but also uh, different state incentives. I, I think the total for this project was a uh, million and a half, maybe two million of that total cost was covered by different state uh, state incentive programs. So what's the savings to the city annually? Uh, annual savings, let me get back to you. Um, yeah, I, I, I could do, do the math. It might be coming later on. And if not, I'll have to circle back to you. Uh, yeah, so, you know, coming up with the scope of the project, a lot of it was our, our team doing energy audits and going through, through the facilities, but also getting input from the staff uh, at Jersey City. We, we talked to probably over 30, 30 to 40 people in all different departments trying to figure out, you know, what are the primary needs that Jersey City has in their municipal buildings? And, you know, how do we kind of prioritize all these different potential projects that, um, uh, you know, could, could be implemented that obviously come at a cost that needs to be balanced. So, uh, at the end, there was, you know, kind of the financial evaluation and the justification where ultimately uh, Jersey City kind of selected what scope of work to uh, to move forward with. Uh, but really, in general, you know, a lot of the issues that we heard and that this project is addressing is about, you know, some of the buildings where they have unreliable heating and cooling systems, where it just was constantly going down. It was end of life. Uh, we had roof leaks. Uh, as shown in the middle in Bethune, where, uh, you know, they had leaks from the HVAC system, they had leaks from the roof, uh, and really not a um, optimal environment for hosting community events or doing a lot of the other things that they do. That, and that's not such an old building, is it? That's not what? That's not such an old building, the Bethune Center. It's not, yeah. That, the, this one, it was, I think, 20 years old or so. Um uh -huh. But you, you know, you still see issues, right, in new buildings and in old buildings. In this case, it was, you know, kind of in a place where a lot of the systems, roofing, HVAC, are kind of getting to the end of their useful life, you know. So if a building was built in 1995 or 2000, now is probably the time that you're starting to see some of these systems fail. And that was the case uh, in Bethune. Um, and then obviously, you know, up here by me in Pershing, uh, with some of the community center, the ice rink and the pool, we had a lot of uh, improvements there. And then, you know, I'll kind of touch on on some of these other needs. But really, a lot of it was focused on where they were having issues, uh, maintenance issues, indoor air quality concerns with water coming into the building uh, and just trying to reduce some of the maintenance costs, as well as uh, obviously energy. So there was a lot of different things that uh, went into it. The picture here is a relatively small measure, but this was installing uh, better air sealing around these uh, bay doors at one of the firehouses. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we install, you know, solar panel on the roof or a new roof or a new heating and cooling system, you know, you might see, uh, but there's a lot of smaller things that are done uh, that may not be a big cost, uh, but they help you know, take the savings a little bit deeper and just make sure that you're minimizing some of that outdoor air infiltration uh, or vice versa. Were, were you involved with the firehouse on Sip Avenue? Uh, that Sip Avenue yes and no. Uh, it, it, in what in what way? We well, did, I mean, that, that was closed down for at least a year and a half, I think, and reopened maybe around two years ago, if I recall correctly. And, you know, since I see this picture of the firehouse and it just occurred to me, oh, may maybe you guys. Yeah, I, I know we did some work on that uh, Sip Avenue, uh, which do you know which one here? Let's let's look Sip Avenue. Uh, 
I don't know if we did do that firehouse because this is the full list of facilities that we worked on. Oh, okay. And I don't see SIP on here unless there's a cross street that I'm missing. Um, but we did work in a lot of the firehouses and police stations. Really the only ones that we did not touch were the facilities that were either brand new or a couple years old that it really didn't warrant any kind of retrofit type of work. Um, yeah, but all in all, uh, every facility got new LED lighting, both interior and exterior. Uh, we installed solar on, and are, are currently installing solar on five of the sites. Uh, two of the buildings, Bethune and the courthouse, uh, both got new roofs to deal with some of the leaks, as well as allow for putting solar on top. Uh, the photo, like what I showed, with the firehouse, uh, really all of these buildings, we found areas to improve the insulation and the air ceiling, um, as well as you know water conservation in, in really all of the facilities. And then a handful of other opportunities that were a little bit more site specific um, based on the needs or based on where we saw uh, efficiency opportunities, um, you know, some of which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, I think one of the big, uh opportunities was was solar pv obviously it's an urban environment so it's a little bit more difficult than uh, maybe some other places within the state to install solar but we were able to identify five state sites that were advantageous um including what's shown here which is uh installing on top of uh the courthouse uh this side Are you talking about the, the courthouse on summit Yes. Uh, yes. I think it's three. Okay, that's great. Yep. It's the municipal courthouse. What, what, what does PV stand for, Dan? Uh, yeah. Photovoltaic. Okay. Yeah. So PV and solar, I might use interchangeably, but it's basically the same thing. It's okay. the uh, solar panels or the system, you know, that, uh, that, that entails. Uh, so so what yeah. were, where were all five sites? So it's the courthouse and what were the other four? Let's go back to our list. So it was the courthouse. It was uh, Firehouse and OEM on Summit Ave. It was Bethune. And then the Kearney Ave Firehouse is four. And then the fifth would be, uh, what is the fifth one? Oh, the Records Building, which is now being turned into a police training center. Um, so the city's doing a big project over there. So once they're What's done, What's that address? Uh, the records would be Linden Ave East. Um, over I can by GPW. It's, oh, it's over by the municipal services complex. I mean, when you, when you, and that was Bill's question, when you refer to the municipal services complex, you mean DPW? Yes. Yeah. Okay. DPW, yeah. DPW facility. Yeah. Okay. So firehouses, DPW, that footprint. And then Bethune is getting solar. Uh, correct. Yep. Here's my list. Lousy. Yeah. So yeah. What, what, what about City Hall? Could that be uh, get solar uh, panels? City Hall, we kicked around. Um, there's really not a lot of roof space up there. Uh, there was also some discussion that we had earlier on in the development process about redoing the HVAC system at City Hall. Uh, which ultimately kind of fell off the list because there's a lot of bigger conversations about what to do with that facility. I think there's some, you know, potentially some facade facade issues or um, there were just a lot of potential projects. And I don't know how much of that is de has developed, but no, we did not see a viable solar opportunity at City Hall. We thought about the parking lot behind City Hall, but I think there were, uh, you know, potentially some other plans for that that lot so it it, it wasn't uh suitable to um to lock up with solar uh at the time so um yes yeah, so then um uh, i'm sorry to, yeah or, or um, you you mentioned that you've worked with the sustainability office and as as deb and i both know very well there's been a lot of turnover in that office in the past few years how has that affected your working with the city? Um, not too much. I mean, I think it, they've got a lot of different people we've been working with over there. Uh, Drew Banghart in, in engineering has been uh, been there from the beginning. 
Uh, and then we all, we'll also work with Barca and, and the business office. So, and then, you know, boots on the ground, we'll work more with the DPW folks and, and different things. So, you know, luckily we've been working with a lot of different, different people over there. Um, so it really wasn't too much of an issue, uh, especially since this project was kind of in, you know, in uh, implementation. Um, but I think for, you know, for newer projects, maybe it would have been more, uh, more of a challenge, but um, uh, yeah, it, it always can be a little difficult when people are, are, are coming and going, but luckily it didn't, didn't impact us too much. That's yeah, good. you're 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 70, 80 percent done. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and it's 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 been been a successful project. So yeah, just kind of finishing up on this one, some progress picks of the court courthouse. We we more or less put a new roof on this building because it's also about 20 years old. Uh, so they've got a brand new roof with a 20 year warranty, and then the solar that at this point it's complete. Uh, these pictures are a couple weeks old. Um, you know, installing that solar. Uh, Bethune, uh, this was really one of the big focuses for, for our project because it's, uh, you know, a highly used community center. Um, you know, it's in obviously uh, one of the most diverse neighborhoods within Jersey City. Uh, it can function as a, an emergency shelter. So uh, it's a space that needs to be reliable. And they had some issues with the HVAC system previously. Uh, I mentioned some leaks that were going on here. So we were able to uh, put a new roof on this entire facility and install solar PV as well as replace the uh, HVAC system. Um, so I've got a couple photos of more or less putting the new roof down here on the left. Uh, the new train units, uh, rooftop units that were installed for heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. and just the uh, the fun process of putting a crane on on this lifting the units and putting everything in place. So uh, that is more or less done. We still have the solar to install here, but uh, this this part of the project is complete. One thing you guys will appreciate is all of these new HVAC systems are heat pump based, so they're heating and cooling. Uh, so no natural gas in these units. Everything that was there before was basically natural gas fired for heating. And then they had the compressor for air conditioning. Uh, but these are all heat pumps, right? So it, it goes both ways, heating and cooling. So we almost eliminated natural gas use at this facility, except for a couple small, almost residential size uh, domestic hot water heaters, which are which were newer so it didn't really make sense to to rip those ones out but for the most part this building was a really good example of you know how, how to decarbonize right you replace the roof put solar on replace your heating and cooling when it's end of its life with heat pumps which are more efficient and electric based so um and and heat pumps basically use uh, solar power is, is that correct uh well they use electric so in this yeah so yeah they use so, the so, solar is creating the electric but we're away from natural gas yeah so and it's not a hundred percent uh which is always hard in an urban environment or even in multi-story buildings uh to be able to offset a hundred percent of the building's usage with um with solar uh if this was a single story or even a two-story building in more of a suburban environment we could probably produce a hundred percent of what the building uses by putting solar on the roof. Um, so we're offsetting some of what it's pulling from the grid, probably a decent percentage, but um, you know, whatever's not uh, created by the uh, the solar, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be pulling from the grid. So, gen so generally speaking, Dan, just for people who yeah. are not, you know, of this, right? To understand what we're trying to do overall, is to, you know, sort of move away and, and it would be good to hear this more from you than from me because I, you know, I'm out there every day and I have my own, you know, perspectives, which are not as expert as yours, but if natural gas, which is primarily how New Jersey, the state of New Jersey is powered, right? The idea 
is that that is still considered a fossil fuel. And if we can get to renewables like solar and there's a big push toward wind, what would that generally mean? And this project has sort of undertaking to do some of that, right? Yeah. So, so overall, does this kind of like, what does this bump out? Because, you know, 70% of the emissions in Jersey City are created by building emissions, mm -hmm. right? And to your point early in the, you know, in the presentation, the municipal assets, municipal buildings are only really 1%, mm -hmm. you know, of the pie, right? So yeah. it's not a big dent, but it's a it, it sort of stands up as a commitment towards something, right? Yeah. So what more, because Schneider's a big player, you know, or, and I'm not sure if you're in an advisory relationship with the city these days, but we're certainly not telling developers to do things differently. You know, lots of development going on in Jersey City. Mm -hmm. are, are we going to line up around, you know, b behind this municipal commitment? You know anything about that? Uh, do I know anything about just generally what you covered or? or yeah, generally about what I covered. And do yeah. you know if the city, because you're an advisor to the city, yeah. is going to kind of try to hear developers to line up? behind what the city's committed to here with their own assets yeah uh i, I mean i'm not aware of any super specific actions i mean i think kind of you know circling back to your question about uh, or bill's comment about you know turnover with sustainability office like i think those kinds of things are where maybe you you can see some things stall out right if you have some of the leadership that may be coming and going but uh yeah i'm, I'm not innately aware uh in terms of what uh, the city is doing to help promote some of the private sector, whether it's, you know, new developers or existing building owners to decarbonize. Um, so there's certainly uh, whatever's going on, I'm I'm not uh, aware of. I mean, we are kind of a, an advisor to the city with with a lowercase a, right? Um, you know, not like a formal kind of consultant that that is tasked with with making some of these uh, policy decisions, but we certainly try and, you know, educate and be involved in in some of those conversations. So um, I, I I think you know the the biggest challenge is uh, you know what what's really within the city's power uh, or authority. What can they do and what should they be doing versus uh, other entities? You know, I think the climate action plan was a good start. I know uh, they had had talked about forming a uh, energy efficiency committee as like a, a follow up with that to like start to set more specific uh, actions and and things in place for energy efficiency in Jersey City. Uh, and if that's happened, I haven't uh, haven't really seen it. But um, you know, I think I think a lot of it in terms of like motivating uh, action in the private sector is going to come down to carrots and sticks, right? Uh, and that's not all going to come from the city. Some of it's going to come from uh, the state or from federal policies that either incentivize or disincentivize uh, natural gas or higher efficiency standards for equipment or more strict building codes. Uh, some of it might come through like utilities. There are a lot of PSC and G incentives that private entities can take advantage of, as well as residents, right? Um, yeah. Or whether you're a renter or or an owner, there's there's options uh, available. So, I, kind of a long-winded answer. I but in general, I don't know the specifics of what Jersey City has planned with more of the private stuff. But uh, I'm I, I'm all all for it. So, hopefully that helps Thank a little bit. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I've only got a couple more slides here. But again, these are some older equipment uh, at Pershing that uh, we were able to to replace to keep the pool operating again you've got a uh, a boiler that you would expect to last 15 years that's been there almost 30 so getting rid of that is a good thing for the reliability of some of these community assets um, so have, have has the boiler been replaced there uh it has yep okay yep. good i forgot and, and is that is that is that the new life span for new equipment which have had all these you know sort of up 
integrated technologies associated with it? Is that the typical lifespan? Uh, li I mean, lifespan is relatively similar. Uh, you know, 15, 20 years for a boiler. Um, I wouldn't say that lifespans have got long, gotten longer, but I would say that they shouldn't have to touch, uh, you know, any of that equipment or infrastructure for another 20 years um, is, would be the expectation. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then really one of the highlights for this this project is the microgrid that we're installing at MSC, the Municipal Services Complex, also known as as DPW, 1315 Linden Ave East. Um, so obviously a newer a newer building where the city runs a lot of its emergency operations. Uh, they do have a large backup generator. They do have a large uh, solar PV system there, about 1.2 megawatts. However, the way the system was set up was if the power goes down, uh, the solar doesn't operate. And the way the generator was tied in was only to emergency loads, which did not include some of their IT systems, phone systems. Uh, you know, so they had an event where they realized that they've got these assets, but they're really not optimized to be able to keep them running through uh through power outages so so as part of our project uh we added in a battery uh and this is i think the battery should be arriving this month but basically a commercial uh scale battery that's going to help bridge the gap uh with the existing assets so we'll take advantage of the 1.2 megawatts of solar the 750 kw diesel generator and then we're adding a battery and we're doing uh, a lot of electrical work and putting in a, a microgrid control center that basically will mean that building uh, will be running um, more or less self-sufficient when when the grid goes down. And it would all depend on, you know, is it is it uh, dark sky, cloudy, rainy, or is it sunny? But they will now be able to use the solar when the grid goes down to keep the building operating, but also to charge some of their new electric vehicles. So pictured here is one of the new EV sanitation vehicles of which they have five. Um, so those will be connected to, to the microgrid so that they're charged by solar. And if the grid were to go down, you know, you're know you not gonna be running a diesel generator to, to fuel your electric vehicle. You're gonna be powering it off the on-site solar which is right there, which is definitely a uh, a greener move. So the diesel uh, generator now becomes the last last resort after the solar, after the battery. Um, and kind of in combination with this, we obviously uh, put in new LED lighting in this facility, made some other changes to the building control system. So we reduced the use and then we're able to do all these optimizations that uh, provide actually a pretty decent amount of savings as well as some new revenue through some of the programs available for peak shedding and uh, what they call frequency regulation, which is just a revenue opportunity for uh, commercial scale batteries. So definitely a big uh, innovative project that you know we're really not aware of anything like it for municipal operations and EV fleets for being able to continue to operate when the grid goes down, because the last thing they want is to lose power and have, you know, trees down across the city and they can't get their sanitation fleet out because they got a bunch of dead batteries. So that will be. We got a general gist of what that is, but there's a lot of terminology in that. Like mm -hmm. what, what, what is peak shedding? Uh, so peak shedding refers to basically your electrical use. So if you think about how much electricity, let's just say your house is using, um, the peak would be like whatever your your peak is, right? So you, you get home on a hot day, you fire your air conditioning up and you turn all your lights on. So if you look at the graph of how much electric is your, your house using, it's whatever the high point is, right? Whatever the peak is. So peak shedding or peak shaving refers to trying to reduce that. Uh, and when you're a resident, a uh, regular homeowner, you don't really get charged for your peak, but if you're a commercial building, you do. So for some commercial facilities, uh, 
40, 45% of your electric cost it can be based on those peaks. And it might even be one peak in the summer. So you might have, you know, uh, and they calculate it uh, in kind of a funny way, but you basically could have a very large portion of your total annual, annual electric costs based on five hours in the summer. Uh, really? So if you can reduce that by, you know, setting your thermostats back a little bit or having a battery that will basically help by discharging the battery to offset what the building is pulling from the grid at some of those peak times, you can reduce those um, those peak demand charges uh, pretty significantly. So it's it's not necessarily a energy saving saving from like a usage standpoint, but it is a cost savings and it does provide that additional uh, resiliency. Well, that that's really cool. And you're saying that there's not, it's sort of a model because Jersey City is kind of leading the charge on this. There aren't other municipalities doing this. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a fair amount of municipalities that have done microgrids or, um, you know, energy resiliency or storage, but we we looked high and low to try and find any examples of like a municipal EV fleet or sanitation fleet that was that had, you know, more or less a microgrid or backup power and we couldn't find any in the country. So that's huge, Dan. Yeah. That's so cool. as, far, as far as we know, I mean, it's the first like. EV, uh, you know, sanitation fleet that is fully powered by a renewable energy microgrid in the country, but uh, someone can might might prove us wrong. But as far as we know, um, but you know, pretty innovative project. Dan, are, are many cities and in, in, in municipalities in New Jersey as well as around the country uh, implementing similar programs to what Jersey City has been trying to do these last few years? Uh, I would say not really. Um, it's it's a little bit complicated uh, electrically and just like technically it can be a little bit complicated. Uh, a lot of entities, you know, it's it's kind of hard to uh, to put a price on, you know, what's the what's the value of energy resiliency, right? Um, you know, some may still kind of feel the pain of Hurricane Sandy or other storms or their outages, but um, you know, to add resiliency comes at a cost. Are people willing to pay that cost? I think is depends on on who you talk to. We do have at least one other uh, municipality that we're working with right now in Central Jersey on a similar project, but um, it's been a little bit slow as far as you know municipal microgrids. There was a BPU program for developing, uh, I believe, twelve like town center microgrids. Uh, that were maybe a little more ambitious than this one in terms of scale and you know footprint, but it just gets a lot more complicated if you're trying to basically build a mini microgrid that's crossing roads and rights of way. Um, but there hasn't been a ton of funding either. I think it's been a little bit slow with the BPU. Uh, the state still hasn't released an energy storage incentive uh even though i think they they had a you know a target uh of a certain amount of battery energy storage by i think it was this year 2023 uh and they're obviously not going to hit that because they have no program or no incentive so um some of the you know policies and incentives are not yet in place to really kind of get more action on these types of projects but um it you know it's 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 coming along yeah, I, I know the state is working on a program, the federal government now has a more uh, substantial incentive. So it, that, that, that's what, you know, has a big impact on. Yeah. Well, do you, do you think the uh, uh, infrastructure act as well as the inflation reduction act, those two very big pieces of legislation providing a lot of federal money will, will mm -hmm. uh, encourage many more municipalities to, uh, uh, initiate similar programs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's, um, and that was one of the things that they uh, more or less codified or, or or finalized was, you know, you can now get a 30% tax credit as a direct payment from the federal government. Even if you don't pay taxes, public entities can now get that, not just for solar and wind as they did previously, but also for battory storage systems or CHP or, or other types of infrastructure. So there what, is- what, 
That's huge. Yeah, what, that's what a is, big, big benefit. What is CHP? What does that stand for? Uh, CHP is uh, called combined heat and power. So it's more or less a system that produces both heat and electricity. So uh, think about either a generator that captures the waste heat to heat water, or you could also think about like a uh, like a hot water heater that you might have in your house. If you had a little device that captured, um, you know, like the steam and spun a turbine to create electricity, but it's it's more or less a more efficient way to, uh, if you do have a hot water heating load, you're heating the water, but you're capturing the waste heat um, as electricity or vice versa. So it's you know a way to go from thirty percent efficiency to eighty plus percent efficiency as far as you know the kind of energy equation. So okay. we did we did install one of those at the Pershing pool to help heat the pool water, but also offset the electric there. Um, uh, so, yeah, that was also part of the project. Dan, could you talk a little bit about your, your company, Schneider Electric? Which yeah, they are I, great. I, I must admit, I, I was not familiar with previously. And what 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 does it do primarily? They are great. Yeah, Schneider's a big company. I often joke we're the biggest company you've never heard of. Uh, but yeah, we're we're in you know 100 plus countries. We've got a long history of different building infrastructure products and services. So you know, in your house, if you have a Square D electrical panel, uh, that's part of Schneider. Uh, you might have like a, a, a circuit breaker or a, a power strip that says APC, that's also part of Schneider's. We've got a lot of different, you know, experience in buildings, both residential, commercial, um, you know, smart buildings. Uh, but really, you know, my I'm with our sustainability business that focuses on the public sector customers. So we're mostly, you know, helping uh, places like Jersey City or other entities to reduce energy use to update their infrastructure to become more sustainable, either through mostly through capital projects, but also through operational changes or how they manage their buildings or, you know, different software tools, uh, you know, EV infrastructure, things like that. What What about county governments? Do you work with many counties? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, I haven't worked with any counties directly. I've worked with some county colleges. Um, but there's a couple counties that I'm talking to actively. We have done actually a couple similar microgrid projects in Maryland with some of the counties as well as in Connecticut. So, uh, yeah, really any any government entity we can and and have worked with at some level. So it would be it would be good to introduce him to Hudson County. I mean, there's a huge initiative within Schneider in the last five years, maybe longer, to work with cities. Yeah. Right, and the way to, to the what the way to embrace some of this is to work at the county level, Bill. So if you can facilitate that level of introduction, whether it's Bill, you know, or but the Hudson and, County and, Improvement Authority would probably be, or that would be great. Well, I don't know about the Improvement Authority, but or the county Bill, executives. Office. I would say Bill O'Day would be very interested to hear more. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any any introductions, that's, you know, how I <laughs> more or less do my business is being able to hopefully do a good job and have people, uh, you know, make introductions. So, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to talk to whomever. Um, yeah. OK. Yeah. I'll I'll uh, introduce you to Bill O'Day and also Arida Ponte Lipsky, the other county commissioner who represents Journal Square and both, oh, both okay. two commissioners that I, I know best and you know I, yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I was Bill all day very well too that would be great I appreciate that yeah, yeah and, and what 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 is your background were you uh, uh an environmental studies major in college where did you go to school and yeah I went to Stevens in Hoboken I I initially was going to do some sort of engineering environment engineering I switched to business but I did get kind of a minor in green engineering so I learned a little bit about renewable energy and things like that. But uh, in general, just uh, focused on business. And, you know, when I came to Schneider, have been on the, the front end helping to develop these types of projects, um, which has been, been great. 
And um, what's your title there at uh, Schneider? Uh, account executive or program manager. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and I know we're kind of coming up on time here. Um, I could just, you know, wrap it up with a couple of the numbers as far as uh, the total impact uh, cost of the project was about 15.3 million uh, over the 20 year lifespan savings and incentives cover the lion's share of that 14.6 uh, million I think Jersey City because uh, again they they want to be to be leading and they care about resiliency was you know willing to uh, make, make an investment that had had a return but really you know required some additional capital to make this microgrid work um, you know so that was that was a benefit. Uh, and then kind of circling back to some of the initial uh, climate promises or, or resolutions that were passed, the big one that we tried to help move the city forward with was this 50% renewable energy by 2025. Uh, so we did a calculation of uh, the city's existing carbon footprint. Uh, they were already in a electric supply agreement, which had a renewable energy component of 25%, which is kind of an off-site thing. So generally a little less preferred than on-site re renewable energy, but we more or less took, okay, what's the existing carbon footprint? What can we do through this project? So basically this, uh, you know, 10, uh, I mean, yeah, 10,000 10, tons of equivalent CO2 every year, uh, reduce that by about 25%. Um, and the numbers here don't add up to 25%, but that's, it, the math gets a little funny. Um, but so, so Dan, what we would like to do, Sustainable Jersey City, is socialize, yeah. a, socialize a graphic that would basically capture your, um, you know, your improvement program. So if what we're doing okay. is reducing this by 25%, figure, you know, I don't know that this is the graphic, but let's work offline to create yeah. something that communicates to the public, mm -hmm. you know, your very good work and the impact of this. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, 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 I think we really want to socialize this. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, let me know and we can circle off offline on that, but um, what key information, if it's just, you know, the carbon, you, 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 like you, you decide yeah. based on this slide, what you want to give us so just think about it. i'm going on vacation for a week we'll circle back in a couple of weeks and just look at it uh -huh. you know, just create a slide or a graphic yeah. and we'll we'll socialize it okay yeah it sounds great i will uh i'll work with one of my marketing people and they can make it look better than i can and simplify it uh, exactly. a little bit. but yeah but I'm, <laughs> but yeah 25 percent reduction in you know greenhouse gas carbon footprint in really only That's a couple huge. of years. And yeah. And, and, you know, we did have a roadmap uh, to potentially get to 50% with all efficiency and on-site solar, the last 50% being a little more difficult. So that was kind of TBD, but there are some potential projects that uh, have been discussed with the city that could be kind of the next, the next round, but overall, um, you know, really solid, uh, step forward for the city on those renewable energy targets. Uh, you know, one thing we didn't talk about too much is the the taxpayer impact because um, you know we were saving about 15 million. The cost of the project was about 15 million. It it more or less which was a budget neutral initiative. You know, not coming at a cost to taxpayers uh, and having a lot of benefits to you know indoor air quality comfort in the facilities and then this kind of first in the nation type of of microgrid uh as a you know ma major benefit to um to the city so right so that 15 million needs to be articulated a little bit better so for example if the cost of the project was 15 million savings was 50 million is that over a 10 year period five year period 20 year period 20 year what period yeah 20 yeah right but but it's a you you said that, uh, if i recall correctly it roughly a 25 percent reduction in greenhouse gases from the so the so these municipal buildings and correct correct yep 25 percent, and that's including all of the buildings but it's not including the street lighting so even though we didn't touch every facility we 
included all of their municipal buildings in that calculation. And just as a final um, set of comments, what do you know about the street lighting thing with PSENG? Uh, not as much as I would like to know. Um, it's kind of been something I've I've poked around trying to find out more. Um, you know, because we have customers that want to upgrade municipalities specifically that want to upgrade their street lighting to LED, but I I don't know what the status is um, as far as if PACNG is rolling out a program. Uh, obviously, they have to go through the Board of Public Utilities for anything substantial that might require a new rate structure or anything else. But I know other utilities, Atlantic City Electric, for example, has had more traction on changing out LED lighting or street lighting. Uh, but it just hasn't happened yet. And, you know, it's been something that I've kind of asked people about for for I'll say years, but for whatever reason, it just hasn't uh, become a real opportunity. Not yeah. yet. Walkie talkie, keep us informed, would you? Yeah. Yeah, so, we'll, we'll do. I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to what's equitable, right? Like if PSE and G is making the investment, you know, because LEDs are more efficient for street lighting, much more efficient. So how much of that benefit should go to PSE and G? How much of it should go to the end users? They've got to go through the state's what they call ratepayer advocate. Um, but the, and then there's also the option of does a municipality own their street lights and PSE and G no longer owns them? That's been done in certain instances. So it's pretty complicated, but it's it's an opportunity and it's it's over half of Jersey City's municipal energy budget is is just street lighting so um wow. it great if something could be done there yeah but wait over 50 percent of the city's municipal energy budget is... electricity yeah so out of three out of three million about 1.2 is buildings about 1.8 i believe is street lighting and traffic lighting wow yeah so uh, bill, we, right? we 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 know, uh, or Deb and I know, uh, Rich Dwyer, who's the uh, community representative for uh, Hudson oh, County yeah. for PSENG, and uh, I, I we we plan to invite him to speak at one of our meetings this fall, probably in October. Yeah, yeah, you should. I've talked to Rich uh, a little bit, and um, yeah, he, he, he would be probably a good person to ask about that. Yeah, he's he's a good guy. Uh, so. Um, Deb and I have had lots of questions for you, but no, nobody else has asked any. So Ash, Helen, David, Jean, Sheeran, and any questions from any of you? That was an excellent presentation, Dan. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Ash. This is Got a lot out of it. Thank you very, very much, Dan. Yeah. That was great. That was great. So we're going to promote this recording. You know, Bill certainly sends it out, as we said. We're going to share it widely. We're just going to try to keep educating folks as it goes. Yeah, sounds good. And then, David, did you have a question? Just a, a very brief one. Um, you said you put the heat pumps on the top of the roof. Um, the colder it gets, the less effective a heat pump in the heat mode works. Do they have electrical backup or do they just deal with the inefficiency? Uh, I'm not 100% sure on these units. They might have uh, some electric resistance as a backup. I'm, I'm going to say they probably don't. Uh, I, I believe, and the heat pump technology has gotten a lot better, like cold climate heat pumps. Yeah, um, but there's, a, there's a fundamental thermodynamic limit. Yeah. So it's of, you know, and then you're not going to beat that. <laughs> The yeah, the temperature difference, the less efficient it is. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I would say ninety percent sure that there's no electric backup for these ones. I know uh, some instances uh, there is, um, but I'm actually doing like a house at my project, or I'm doing a project at my house, and we're going all electric. So uh, the unit that I'm that we're going to be living in, it's going to be like a, a, a two unit. Uh, all heat pumps, no electric backup, and you know, 24/7 outside air. But 
but the basement unit, the way we designed it is actually bringing in more outside air. So it's still a heat pump, but that one does have electric backup. So it's uh, a lot of the systems I don't think have, but some of them do. I think it really depends on, you know, the design of it and how much outside air you're bringing in and a number of different factors. Okay, any, any other questions from anyone? I think we're there. Okay, so uh, Dan, thank you very, very much. And I, as I said, I'll be in touch with uh, Bill O'Day and uh, Arida Ponte Lipsky. I'll copy Deb and you, of course, and just yeah. as an introductory message. And uh, you know, we'll we'll put this on. Uh, um, we'll we'll circulate the link to the recording, and hopefully, yeah. more people will see that. Sounds good. Dan, and do you send that via Dan, email Dan, or do you, you post send, it on? Can, Dan, can you send us your presentation, please? Because we attach that. Yeah, for sure. I'll uh, save it here and send it uh, in a few minutes. Yeah. And uh, consider becoming a member of the Journal Square Community Association. We could use you. And I think, uh, you know, you would enjoy it. And uh, yeah, we're, we're very active in the city. Yeah, sounds good. I appreciate the invite. I did put the... Um, what was it? The uh, Bergen Bergen Square Day on my calendar, September. Right, 16th, right. I, I think you said so. Uh, I'll look go at to our event. website, jsqca.com. You know, you can join us. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, all right. So all right, anything else? Uh, so we're not meeting that's again good. until September. So I think that's September twentieth or something like that. But right, Deb third, third, third Wednesday in September. We're off for the summer. Enjoy the rest of your summer, everybody. And, you know, tell the next person that you actually learned something here tonight and invite them to our next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Take Thank care. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye now.